the Smart Buildings Academy podcast with Phil Zito, episode 440. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and welcome to episode 440 of the Smart Buildings Academy podcast. So in this episode, we are going to be discussing employee engagement strategies. I got a little bit of house cleaning items to do before we get started. Uh, one of the big ones that I want to do is actually take a second talk to you about a tool I've been using that uh, is not a sponsor. I don't get any money from this. It's just something been really helpful to me. I have ADHD. I tend to try to take notes when I'm on customer calls or internal meetings, and it doesn't do really well uh, for me taking notes. So I found the software called read.ai. It comes with Zoom. And if you use it, it'll actually create transcripts. Uh, I always ask permission before I meet with anyone. Hey, do you mind if my AI note taker takes notes? Um, and doing this has been extremely helpful for me. It tells me like, hey, what action items do I have from this meeting? What do I owe the person? What are the key topics that were covered? So if you do a lot of online meetings, uh, whether on the ops side of things or the sales side of things, it's a software I highly recommend you look into. Maybe one of these days I'll do a podcast on it, kind of talk through how it works. But as a productivity tool, I definitely want to bring that to your attention. The other housekeeping item uh, before we get started with the episode is if you are finding value from these episodes, I encourage you to go and like and subscribe on YouTube or on Facebook. Go and like and comment and share this with your network of folks. And if you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, please leave us a five-star review if you think we've earned it. It really helps spread the podcast. So that being started, everything will be available at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 340 or 440. Oh my gosh, 400 episodes. Uh, once again, podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 440. I will be watching the comments as we go through this episode. If you've got anything you want to ask about, please do not hesitate to interrupt. It doesn't phase me if you do that. So this episode, we're going to be talking about employee engagement, retaining and cultivating talent. Uh, we're going to cover kind of the industry challenges that probably should be familiar to all of you. Things like employee retention. Uh, maybe you are in a corporate environment and you're limited as far as, you know, what monetarily you can give to your employees. How can you go and mitigate that? What does culture mean? Uh, you know, you see all this stuff on LinkedIn, uh, these like boss versus leader and all these memes. And quite honestly, they're freaking annoying to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, if I see one more meme on this crap. But there is something to be said about culture and engaging your team. And really, culture is a fancy way of saying mission. Like, what is our mission? What are we really about at this organization? Are you about making money? If so, okay, that's great. Are you about improving the environment for, you know, K through 12 so people can learn? Uh, students can have a successful learning environment. That's great as well. But have some sort of mission. And then how do you align your talent around that mission? We'll talk about retaining talent in monetary issues. We'll talk about, you know, if you're in a corporate environment or if you're in a larger system integrator, like how do you effectively deal with employees that shouldn't be in the business? Like how do you manage them out of the business? Uh, and how do you go and figure out if someone should be managed out of the business? How do you balance uh, technical and cultural fit? Uh, I'll be honest. Um, Having run a business with, you know, probably now 14,000 students, uh, I will say that a small, like minuscule amount of people were intellectually incapable of doing this field. Like they just would not get it no matter what. The majority of people who wouldn't work out, it was an attitude thing. It was not a capability issue. So I'll tell you that's uh, another big one that uh, we're going to talk about here. How do you re-engage disengaged employees? There's a lot of people who are super burnt out after this summer. How do you re-engage them? And then we'll go into question and answer. So with that being said, let's kick off the show. All right. So it's no mystery that we are in a talent crisis 
of our own making in this industry, uh, you know, just due to a comedy of errors, uh, letting go people in 2000, restructurings in 2008, a um, variety of different issues during COVID. We've got an industry where the middle amount of people have been virtually cut in most businesses. And you've got senior people and green people. There's a very weak across the board, a very weak middle structure of talent in our organization. So you see a lot of people like I'll talk to leaders and I'll find leaders who are high level leaders in organizations and they're reviewing designs. They're out, you know, looking at programming. They're out on projects that are not seven figure projects engaging with the contracting tier something's broken there and the reality is if you read the studies if you dig into it you know studies like from deloitte where they say having a talent management structure that really emphasizes what the critical roles are and has career paths you're looking at a 40 percent lower turnover rate and i would imagine that's only going to increase with time why why will that increase and and I really want you to track with me as we paint this picture here. Like, what does this look like? And I'll be bouncing back and forth in the chat, trying to see if y'all are asking questions as we go through different things. Um, but if you look at why this turnover rate is happening and why people with talent management have decreased turnover, there's only so much you can pay your people. Let's be honest, especially if you're in the owner space. I mean, if you're in the owner space, you are not competing on salary. Let's be real. Uh, contractors are going to destroy you from a salary perspective, unless you're Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft and you're part of like a data center practice. Then you can compete. Uh, actually, you can outperform contractors on salary. But uh, if you're, you know, a hospital operating on near zero margin or actually negative margin due to reimbursement rates, and everything not keeping track with inflation, you're not competing on salary. So how do you compete? Having a clear talent management structure that emphasizes, hey, what are our non-monetary incentives? How is our labor structured? Like maybe people like to drive to an office and work in a single building versus driving all over the state of, let's just say Alaska or you know Wyoming and you have to drive far from job site to job site, maybe that's burning your people out. And maybe as a hospital, you could say, hey, you just have to come into this one place every day from seven to three, and it's predictable. People can plan their life around it. There is a aspect to that that really helps you compete from a monetary perspective. So having that all structured out is really important. So as an industry, Right now, and, and this isn't statistical, but I will say talking to dozens of companies every week, hundreds of companies each month, thousands of companies each year, about half of them, the first words out of their mouth are, we are missing people in XYZ role. We are short programmers. We are short managers. We are short technicians. Like how many of you listening and you can post this in the comments <clears throat> how many of you are short some role you don't have to give me specifics of what role you're short but how many of you and once again just post this in the comments i'll try to find it how many of you are short some role i'm willing to bet that there's a big chunk of you that it's either on technicians so it's either on the front side the installing technicians, the startup technicians, or it's on the backside, the project managers or programmers. Um, we tend to see organizations are fairly solid for some odd reason on design, but it's those two roles that have kind of not really been filled or properly managed. So how do you deal with that? Like, what do you do to address that challenge? And we'll discuss that a little later in the episode. I'm just going to check right here make sure no comments coming through okay cool so let's keep going 
So one of the ways you manage engagement is having a talent management plan. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But one of the key things is figuring out like, what do you want to be as a company? Um, When I talk to companies and I find that they have high uh, margin percentages, or at least they tell me they have high margin percentages, executed margin, I almost always hear that they have a strong vision, a strong mission, and a strong culture because you don't get too high margin by taking on everything. Like if you are trying to do every plan and spec job, every design build job, every owner direct job, those are three different cultural differences. Like how you deal with owners is completely different than how you deal with the contracting tier how you structure your team is different, how the styles of your sales force, the style and approach of your technical staff. I really want you to key in on that for a second. So if you are sitting there and you're listening to me right now and you manage a PNL, or you are on the owner side and you manage a facilities team, need to really ask yourself, like, who is your customer? If you're in healthcare, your customer is the patients and the nurses, right? If you are a contractor that does owner direct to municipalities, then your customer, right, is the municipality. You don't want to go and using that municipality example, you don't want to go and structure your business like you're pursuing plan and spec three-story commercial office work. That is a completely different sales team, much less consultative sales team. That's a completely different operations team. Um, Working off plan and specs for three-story office buildings is a complete different level of complexity than going and working owner direct where you're the engineer of record or you're the one designing the submittal set and taking on all of that risk. So I want you to consider that as you go about laying out your culture. So so what do you do? Well, first thing you want to do is define your ideal customer. So if you know that your ideal customer is healthcare, then you have to ask yourself, how are we going to get the healthcare business? Well, if it's bid business, then you staff your team accordingly. If it is going to be owner direct business, you staff your team accordingly to that. And that's going to have permutations throughout your culture, right? So owner direct, you're going to look for people with a certain, we use disc in our business. You're going to look for people, you know, typically with a higher I, higher S, higher, um, lower D. If you're doing, you know, plan and spec work, you're going to look for a higher D, a higher direct dominance, Um, because you're going to be dealing with contractors. You're going to be dealing with kind of the cutthroat world of plan and spec work where it's very tight and cost-driven. And your team is going to be executing on tight margins. So you're going to have to have really strong processes, um, very little flexibility in your approach, completely different than owner direct work. So I want you to consider that as you think through your culture. Hopefully this is making sense. This isn't something... Unfortunately, I really see people talking about in our industry. Everyone wants to talk about AI. They want to talk about smart buildings, all this fun stuff. And then no one can execute work because they're not properly staffed or the people they're staffed with aren't the right people. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. You have a bucket of $100 and you have 10 employees and not all 10 employees are equal. Who do you give the money to? Well, in an ideal world, and this is where things are kind of broken from a monetary structure, right? In an ideal world, everyone would be A players. Everyone would be great. You would have unlimited money and you would pay people to be top performers. But that's just not how things work, right? The Pareto principle, 20% of your revenue in sales is, or 80% of your revenue in sales is going to come from 20% of your people. 80% of your margin is going to come from 20% of your people. You're going to look at like, where do I get my most margin from? And it's those high performers who, you know, way over deliver 
on uh, the expectation that they're faced with. So how do you compensate these people? Because you're going to run into a monetary ceiling. I think, uh, and feel free to s- say something in the comments about this, but um, what I'm seeing by and large with organizations is they're starting to run into a ceiling on how much they can pay. Either they're not able to find people. Everyone who's willing to jump ship is gone. You're not willing to invest in someone who's probably a one twenty to one forty thousand dollar a year employee because you don't know what you're going to get. Um, you've been burnt enough with um, hiring people that supposedly are really good, only to find out they're not. So what can you do to retain people and what can you do to attract people? This is where benefits come in. Uh, I encourage you, if you're ever like really want to prove this theory, and this is was really eye-opening to me when I actually went and did it, um, go to Glassdoor. A lot of reviews about companies, right? Look at how many of those reviews are people complaining about management? Are people complaining about non-monetary things? Okay, hey, um, the healthcare or the time off or the um, engagement by the manager, the leadership, the engagement by the CEO. How many of those complaints exist versus, hey, we're underpaid, they pay crap? Paying... At market value is kind of the, it's, you know, the ticket to get into the show. It's accepted that you've got to pay near market value. So with that being said, now your competitive side comes from what you can offer people. So let's get into some specifics of what you can do. I'm not going to say the most obvious one, which is training, because that's kind of biased. We run a training organization and me saying you should train everyone. That's kind of self-serving. So let's talk about other things you can do for people. Uh, A couple things you could do. One, define a career path for your employees. I'm still shocked to this day how many organizations I talk to, they they cannot quantitatively. So the difference between qualitative and quantitative Quantitative is, hey, um, it's either true or it's not true. It's either one or it's zero. It's a state. Qualitative is a feel. I feel like something is true. I feel like this person's good. I feel like they're doing a good job. I'm still surprised how many businesses have not implemented a quantitative. If you want to be a tech level one, you need to know these five things and here's how you quantitatively demonstrate these five things like you need to know how to wire up a thermostat and here's how you demonstrate that and you either can or you can't by having that kind of structure level one level two level three tech and then showing them how they progress that gives someone a roadmap and when someone has predictability they are less susceptible to poaching i really want that to stick in If you get one thing from this episode, if you can provide predictability to your employees, they are significantly less likely to leave your business. Because think about the times you left. Think about the progression of when you left and went to another job. You started to wonder, when am I going to get promoted? Man, I see other people talking about how much they're going to get paid and how much they're paid. When, when am I going to get to that point? How do I get to that point? What do I need to do to get that raise? And it becomes unclear. People are like, I'm not sure. I don't know what I need to do. And so then doubt starts and they start to envision this better opportunity. Maybe it's better working for so-and-so. Maybe such and such would pay more. Maybe I would do this. Maybe I'm never going to get that programmer job. Maybe I'm never going to get that tech level three job. And because they have that unclarity, that lack of clarity, that then drives people to think to themselves, I'll entertain that offer. I'll entertain that discussion. And if you pair that with a totally disconnected boss, (coughs) excuse me, who knows nothing about their employees 
and a business that has no mission and no common goal that the employees are trying to achieve, it's a recipe for people leaving your business. So if you're losing people left and right, I highly encourage you to ask, did this person know what they were going to do, how they were going to get promoted, how they were going to advance? Did I hold them to a level of standards, which we'll talk about standards and expectations and performance management in a bit because it's huge. But those are things I really want you to go and consider. All right, so let's talk. I'm actually going to skip ahead a little bit. I'm going to talk about talent management or performance management. You know, I'm former military. And in the military, there's a term, any of you who have served in the military will immediately know what I mean by this. There's the standard. And the standard's impartial. The standard is the standard. And you either are at the standard or you're not at the standard. And I run into too many organizations, and I've been guilty of this as a leader myself, that are fluid with their standards. And here's what happens. You have these top performers. Uh, maybe they're an amazing programmer. Maybe they're an amazing designer. And they look around and they see people who aren't amazing, who are late on their designs, late on their programs, repeatedly making mistakes. But nothing happens to that person because you need bodies, right? You need those bodies. You need those people because how could your business run without those people, right? Right, Phil? We're in a talent shortage, Phil. We are barely able to execute the work we have. We need to have those people. And it doesn't matter if they're at least they're 80% effective. Well, the problem is with top performers, they're going to see that. And that's infectious. That lack of holding people to the standard of holding people accountable is going to create a problem. And that problem is going to start to affect the fringes. You have those 20% of people who are going to be awful. You have those 20% of people who are going to be amazing no matter what. And then in the middle, you have that 60% that are malleable. They may be great performers, but if they see people who are getting away with not doing the standard, they themselves are going to fall into that behavior and habit. This is the one thing you really, as a leader, need to be keeping your eye on. And I'd be interested how any of you right now are performance managing people against a standard. Like what standards have you established? Maybe it is a revenue per FT. Maybe it's a margin per FT. Maybe it's a jobs per task. Maybe it is how many callbacks you get. What standard are you holding your technical people against? And then sales, that's super easy, right? You either have a revenue standard or you don't. You have a margin standard or you don't. You have a activity standard or you don't. And do you hold people accountable to that? Now, before you all blow me off and you're like, what the hell is Smart Buildings Academy? Like, why are you telling me about this? Uh, I recently talked with an organization. Um, I won't get into any specifics. Uh, but they said they had people who were not a cultural fit. They were not performing at the standard. And these people left and they decided to do their own thing. After these people left that organization, they had their best year by revenue. Um, that organization had their best year by revenue because these people were a boat anchor against the top performers. So it's something I really highly encourage you to consider as you're sitting there thinking about what do I need to do in my business? Phil said, engage people around a culture. Phil said, go and do some soft skill or soft non-monetary benefits. That's the carrot. The stick is the standard. And the standard doesn't have to be punitive. It's impartial. It is this is what you're going to do activity-wise. This is what you're going to do performance-wise. And you either do it or you don't. All right. So I'll pause, see if we have any questions across any of the platforms. I know I just laid out a ton of information for you all. Um, and I want to see if that created. Uh, you say we're short in talent, but as a candidate cannot get past a recruiter, what can we do about that? So I would ask, what have you done about that? 
One of the things I say to my people, um, I'll, I'll just give you um, tough love. What have you done? So when my sales reps tell me they can't reach so-and-so and I ask them, I'm like, what have you done? Oh, we called the office. Okay, great. What else did you do? No, we sent them an email. Okay, great. What else did you do? Did you look at who this person's connected to on LinkedIn? Did you look at who the hiring manager is and reach out to them and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Hiring Manager, I realize there's a lot of people who don't show up to work, have no work ethic, and are a burden to your business. I may not know controls as well as everyone else, but what I do know is I will show up to work every day. I will do what you ask me to do. I will not be a pain in your ass, and I will spend my nights learning and becoming better. I don't know a single manager that if you reached out to them directly and said that to them, would not at least have a conversation with you. Now, I mean, yeah, if you know nothing, you're, you know, a chef and you're applying for a programmer three role. Yeah, let's be real. But if you are a, you know, person who is working on IT and you're applying for a technician one role and you were to message that, then you're going to get some interest. I, I will tell you that. So it's level of initiative. Um, be honest with you. There's a lot of people who have no initiative and you just have to look on social media and that proves that fact to be true. So that's my answer. Hopefully it didn't come across harsh. Hopefully it came across as encouraging because there's a ton of people. Okay, let's see. You wrote something. In one example, I took the issue all the way to the owner and the recruiter then responded with, we have filled that role. Um, it's still open. So go somewhere else. I mean, unless you live in like the middle of nowhere and there's no one else. Um, if you've approached it the way I've told you, I would be shocked if you live in a metropolitan area that you can't get um, an interview. Pending, you know, all the, the things like physically able, um, pass a background check, no criminal record, that stuff. Assuming that's all true, <coughs> um, I would be surprised. I really would because I talk to leaders every day and I will tell you the thing they say to me is, I wish we could find people with work ethic. I wish we could find people who have the desire to grow. That is their biggest ask um, because I started off this episode with building automation is not rocket science. I mean, it's not, this is not the hardest. I, we teach this stuff all the time. This is not the hardest stuff to learn. Problem is we've had crappy teaching in our industry for a long time. We've tried to teach how to use software without teaching people underlying theory and then wondered why they blew stuff up. Um, and it's like, well, because they don't know how the stuff works. You could teach them to use a tool, but they don't know how stuff works. So hopefully that helps. I'd be more than happy to continue this discussion towards the end of the podcast. Let me know. Uh, let's go back. Okay, so I talked about some uh, things you can do from a perspective of uh, non-monetary things. I talked about things you can do, uh, from a cultural perspective. And I talked about going and es establishing a standard. Let's talk about how do you root out these disengaged people that are a boat anchor to your business? Um, which may seem counterintuitive right now because there is a labor shortage. And why am I telling you to find people who are ineffective in your business and are not working when you need bodies to execute work? Uh, I will tell you that on average, depending on the studies you read, someone who's quiet quitting, someone who is not engaged and is just checking the box, 
is going to cost you anywhere from 20 to 40% of their salary. So let's say you got a programmer and they you pay them $100,000 and they are working at half capacity. That person could be costing you 30 to 40 grand a year. Now, let's say you could go and replace that programmer. Let's say again, you could replace that programmer for 120. You could potentially get a higher quality person who you're essentially already paying for. So you really have to evaluate. Now you're like, okay, Phil, but we can't find programmers anywhere. Yeah, I agree. You can't. Um, if you could, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So develop them, whether that's with SBA training or that's your own internal development. Just do that. It's not that hard to create a programmer. I know some of you are going to tune out as soon as I say that. Um, we've got so many success stories uh, that I can put you in touch with. It, it's not hard. It's a matter of you teach them the sequence of operations, you teach them how HVAC works, teach them how to read a spec and then create the design patterns from the spec. Um, specifications are written in such a way that if you know how to read the sequence of ops, it breaks out into a pattern again and again. Um, an example of which would be like um, enabling an economizer, enabling a chiller, enabling a boiler. They all use a comparative pattern. Um, two analog values compared to one another that produces a Boolean result. Teach them that pattern. Great. You've taught people how to go and engage a economizer, engage a chiller, or engage a boiler, all based off of some analog variable. It's that approach that you can put in place to take existing people and train them up. Whew, holy crap, we're already at 30 minutes. Um, all right, so let me give you some quick hit actionable things you could do right now to improve this. Uh, first things right now you could do as an employer is go talk to each employee and ask them what their career plan is. Ask them, where do they want to be in six months? Where do they want to be a year? Where do they want to be in two years? Do that next week. Next thing, ask them where they're dissatisfied. Now, this may seem counterintuitive. You may be like, oh, crap, I don't want to go and ask someone where they're dissatisfied because that is going to put ideas in their head that they may not have had previously. It's actually the opposite. If you ask people what they like the most, then you're going to run into something that is called the, uh, what is it? The negativity bias. So someone will say, and I use this all the time in selling, by the way, if you've ever been on a sales call with me um, and I've called you and you're one of our prospects and I've said to you, what do you like most about your ABC's training? because maybe you're using something else or maybe you're doing internal training. Uh, I'm spilling the beans here. And I say to you, uh, what do you like most about your internal training? I say that because I know statistically you are going to start telling me what you don't like about your internal training. But the opposite works as well. If I ask you, what do you not like about something? you're actually more likely to defend that, to turn positive. It's a weird dynamic of human behavior. So by asking people what they don't like, um, you may get one or two negative responses unless they're really gone, at which point that's also good to know. Um, but it's also going to give you an awareness of where this person finds value in your company. And guess what? Once you hear that same message from two or three employees, that this is why they stay, this is why they find value in your org, that's what you should do. That's what you should double down on. Don't double down on the complaints. Double down on the positive things. I mean, fix the complaints, obviously, if they're major. So that's item number two. Item number three, create development. This takes a little bit more effort, but create a development path and this is something we can help your organization with. Just reach out to us at our website. But create a development path for your teams. Does your installer know how they can become a programmer? Do they have a pathway to that? If they don't, create that. And that should be a quantitative pathway. It should say, hey, this is what I need to know. And this is what I need to prove. 
And if I do that, then I will progress to here and I'll progress to here. And then I will get to this goal. All right, folks, I'm going to open it up for questions. Thank you all for being here and listening so far. I hope you have found value in this episode and uh, be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Let me go around the horn. Check all the usual places. What do y'all think? Do you want more of this kind of like business-esque content? I know our our listening audience is really diverse. And I always kind of wonder, because I've got, I mean, we started off being really technical. We bounce into sales. We bounce into IT. We bounce into business. Um, what do you all find to be the most valuable content for you organizationally? Um, I'd be very interested in knowing kind of what exactly you all need to know from a value perspective. Um, as always, everything that uh, we do here is going to be available at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 440. Once again, that's podcast dot smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 440. This podcast will be up on iTunes within the next hour or so. And uh, if you need anything, do not hesitate to visit our site. If you found this valuable, please share it on LinkedIn. Um, let the folks in your connections know about this. That really helps. And I'd really appreciate that. Um, and if we've earned a five-star review on iTunes, please leave it. Um, I definitely appreciate that. It spreads the podcast. I would also suggest as a hiring manager, really understand what the, well, yeah. I mean, write the correct job description. Someone having 25 years of N4 experience is obviously unrealistic. And yes, I'm exaggerating, but we see plenty of uh job postings that were obviously written by someone who has never done the job and has no idea what needs to be done in the job because they're asking for things that um, I saw. One of the funniest I ever saw was this guy who created this uh, JavaScript application, um, this JavaScript language, and he posted a job description and it said, um, must have five years of experience with whatever JavaScript. And he's like, I don't know how anyone's going to do this. I created the language and I created it two years ago. So I don't know how someone's going to have five years experience. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. I appreciate your time. It's invaluable. And if we can serve you in any way, do not hesitate to let us know. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care.